um, and Boris Springfield, the lay pastor here at Middletown Community United Methodist Church. And we are having a special meeting. It is being streamed live. If you do not wish to appear, uh, if you have any questions or comments, the focus is going to be on Reverend Blake and as a visit, as opposed to on individuals. If you wish to identify yourselves and what your position is in the church, that's fine, that's up to you. Otherwise, we'll have an overview and then open for questions if someone has questions or comments. Um, I did not receive any online. I'm going to check one more time because I asked people to send them by 9 a.m. if they had any questions or comments on the church website. But I'm uh, happy that you are with us, and I will turn it over to right. Reverend Blake Thank Houston. you very much, Mark. Thank you so much. It's good to be with all of you. It's always great to be here yeah. for the worship. I first of all just want to share this grace. I'm sure you do as well. That's my appreciation for That's Boris, uh, for her spiritual leadership here, and just for her dedication to this work, and to all of you for your faithfulness and your ministry here, the ways in which you all are worshiping community, but also a community that's connected and reaching out in this community and making a difference. So just really celebrate that and I'm grateful for, for all that. What I'd like to do, I think, is just make a couple of opening kind of comments just in general and then see and then be open to what direction you want to go in. I'm happy to go wherever you want to go. If you have questions about some things you've been hearing or just wondering about certain kinds of things, I'm happy to do that. So I don't want to take too much time. And opening here, I'll just say a few things, and then we can just see uh, what direction we'd like to talk and we'd like to go in. That's all right. So um, one of the things that has been uh, getting some attention this year is there has been a, a number of churches in our denomination that have uh, chosen to disaffiliate, is the language that we use. So you may have been reading about some of that. There's quite a few churches in the southeast, for instance, in Texas, and some conferences. Uh, in other parts of the of the world, there's a significant number of churches that are that are disaffiliated, that are that are separating from the United Methodist Church. Some of them are becoming independent. Some of them are uh, joining other denominations. Some of them are joining a new denomination, which has just started, called the Global Methodist Church. And so I just say that because sometimes people get information around all kinds of things. So that's kind of been happening this year. It's happening this year primarily because there is a provision this year in the, in the Book of Discipline, which is what we use to kind of sort through these things, that allows for this disaffiliation to take place under certain terms and conditions. Uh, and then there'll be another general conference next year that may or may not address this question again, and may or may not offer different terms and conditions for separation for those who want to do that. Back in uh, 2016, there was a general conference, and there was a lot of discussion around the issues of removing a lot of the statements in the Book of Discipline that have to do with prohibiting um, the, languages, the languages prohibiting self-avowed practicing homosexuals from being ordained in the United Methodist Church. That's the language that was put in the Book of Discipline in 1972. And ever since 72, there's been some effort at every general conference to remove it. And it came to come ahead in 2016, where it came to a head again, and there was a lot of controversy around all of that. And then so they decided to, to call it a special general conference in 2019 to address only this issue, basically. And so in 2019, there was a general conference, and there were some provisions made and some agreements made that at the 2020 general conference, there was a hope that some things would be resolved one way or another. Well, what happened in 2020? Okay. The pandemic. So the 2020 General Conference has actually not happened yet. Uh, it's confusing. It's going to happen in 2024. Right? So next year, the 2020 General Conference will happen. So what happened was the, the, there was some agreement that were being made about some churches who there were some disagreements around the issue of homosexuality in the church and ordination and, and, and holy unions and marriage and things like that. There was some hope that, that there would be some resolution in 2020. That didn't happen, and so it still hasn't happened. And so there was a movement with those who wanted to, to leave to do so now rather than wait till 2024. Does that make sense so far, just in terms of the flow of things? Mm -hmm. it, how often are general conferences? Every, and general conferences are every four years. Thank you. Every four years. 
that it was a special one, that's very unusual, to deal with just this issue. Then there was, it was expected that there'd be some resolution in 2020. That hasn't happened yet. And some people still felt that, you know, they weren't going to wait till 2024. They wanted, they wanted to kind of take action now to do that. So in 2019, there was actually a provision, it's, it's paragraph 2553, that was added to the Book of Discipline to allow for some churches to disaffiliate now if they wanted, if they wanted to, under certain terms and conditions. And so that's what's been happening this year, is, is that the churches that have been leaving this, this year uh, have used that paragraph and have followed those rules to do that. Uh, and so we have, we have about 330 churches in our annual conference, and we have uh, six churches that have voted to disaffiliate. And those six churches were also voted on at annual conference session last week, because it requires the annual conference also to agree uh, that uh, if the church votes to disaffiliate, the annual conference has to also vote to uh, allow them to disaffiliate. And so last week, there was a vote taken at the annual conference to allow those six churches to disaffiliate. Okay, so in our district, which is the great northern district that I'm the district superintendent for, we have 97 churches. And out of the 97, we have three churches in our uh, district that, have, that went through the process to, to disaffiliate. That process was to contact me uh, and say that, that the church council has taken a vote to enter the process of discernment. Then it was to meet with me and, and some other conference representatives to talk about the, the nature of the church, talk a little bit about this history, talk about what it means to be the body of Christ together, uh, talk about some of the issues around this particular issue, and then to help prepare them for, to help to prepare their members so they have the, the information they needed to make their decision about how they wanted to vote. Then there was another meeting <clears throat> to talk about the terms and conditions, make sure they understood what, what the terms and conditions were. Then there was a final meeting, which was a church conference, a church conference, I should say, which is a meeting with myself and the church membership to take a vote. And, and so, at that point, we felt they were all prepared and understood everything, and they were, each member had enough information they could decide for themselves how they wanted to vote. And, and it required uh, two-thirds uh, of people voting to disaffiliate for it to be approved. So it's, you know, super majority, basically, to approve that. So those six churches went through that process, and they got the two-thirds vote to decide to disaffiliate at, at that point. So that's just a mechanical process of what you may be hearing about disaffiliations and about what's happened in this, in this church, in this conference. The other thing I would just say is that, 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 that those who are remaining in the United Methodist Church, uh, which is again for our conference is, you know, almost most of us, almost all of us, is that we are a church that's quite diverse. We're quite diverse in terms of our, we're talking about having open minds. And so in all of our churches, you know, even, even in, in all of our churches, we have members who uh, have many different thoughts and opinions about many things, as you may know, maybe even here, right? Uh, whether it be on this issue of LBGTQ issues, or whether it be on issues of uh, climate change, or whether it be issues of politics, or whether it be issues of... So we generally have, in our churches, uh, a congregation of people that, uh, that often disagree vehemently with each other about all kinds of things. But yet, uh, for most of the case, locally we find ourselves that we found that there's ways in which we feel that we're still a family, and that we're still the body of Christ together, and that even though we have differences, we feel that God has called us together and to work through them. Some of these differences are over the interpretation of Scripture. And, uh, and, and since we value Scripture as the primary way in which we understand God's will in our life, it's those ways, it, it, it's the way in which we help each other to interpret scripture, that's also important. And so we have value in our United Methodist churches everywhere, the high value of scripture, and the need for us as a community of faith to rely upon the Holy Spirit, to get together, and to help each other to interpret scripture. And when we do that, sometimes we still don't end up in the same place. Yet we end up with the same value that we're trying to do, we're trying to be led by the Holy Spirit, we're trying to hear what God is saying to us in this place at this time, and to interpret the scripture, and then to live it out, right? To live it out faithfully as we can. Often we come to an understanding uh, together about what that is and what that means. But on some issues, frankly, we do not. And yet, uh, most of us still feel that, that we still feel called to be together and to keep working through this together and how we interpret things and how we live them out, even if we, even if we say we don't. 
two more things I want to say, and I'll open up for questions and see where you want to go. One of them is, is that when I was in one church, uh, we decided that we were going to do a series of sermons and, and group kind of classes and studies around uh, uh, as many of the controversial issues that we could name. And so we made a bunch of controversial issues. So we're going we're gonna to preach and talk about and teach about these things. They're the things you often try to avoid <laughs> in polite company or in the, because they're so, they're so, you know, bring such conflict and such division sometimes. But what we did was we, we decided to do this series, but we decided to, uh, at that time we were having communion once a month. And we decided to, we had uh, movable chairs. We decided for this series we are going to take the, the communion table, we're going to put it in the center of the room, and we're going to gather around the communion table, we're going to have communion every week, and we're going to remember that our unity is in Christ. Our unity, and God has called us together by our baptism, and we're going to have communion together, and then we're going to talk about all the things that we disagree about. <laughs> and our point was trying to say that, you know, we, we agree that we, we love the Lord, we agree that God, is, we're trying to understand what God's will and purpose for us is, and we agree upon, kind of, as Christians, how we approach these issues. Right? There's the ways in which we interpret Scripture. There's the ways in which we value, in our, in our Western background, Scripture as authority, but also tradition and experience and reason. As Westerns, we, we, we use those to help us to interpret Scripture. We talked about how we interpret and the variety of ways of interpretation. In the, in the message, I tried to give a kind of a balanced kind of perspective, biblical perspective, on how various positions might be, might be established, right? And then we kind of talk about that. Now that's in contrast to the way our society is right now. Our society is very polarized. Our, our society right now really kind of, the way I describe it, I don't know how you describe it, I describe it as it's kind of like we're, we're being called as, as, as people to take, to take a side, to be a part of a team, and to defeat the other team. Right? And so we, we, we'll take kind of thing, and, and it's almost like a game which we're trying to win. And we get, we get absorbed in that. But that's not the way, of course, we as Christians understand this. We understand that we're all subject to the word and will of God, that we're all guided by the Holy Spirit, and we all need to be open and humble about how God might lead us and change us even about what we think and do. And that coming together with each other sometimes is very helpful in that, even though we might come to a final agreement. So one final comment. In my first church, I learned a lesson very early on, which I valued the whole time, is I had a disagreement with my lay leader. No, he was my lay leader. Yeah, I made him my lay leader after our disagreement. So I thought, we need, be, we, need, we need to be more kind of There was an issue in which I felt very strongly about that as a matter of conscience, I should be a part of. And he thought I was wrong. Okay? And so we had wonderful conversations about that. Respectful, wonderful, biblical. Here's the way I see it. Here's the way I see it. Here's why I think I need to do this. Here's why I think you know, you're wrong. But then the last, no, the young, I was a young man at that time. I was 24. You know, he was my, my elder. The last thing he said to me was, he said, but Blake, you, know, you need to do what you feel God is calling you to do. And I support you in that process of discernment. I think you're wrong. I'll tell you why you're wrong. But you know, you do need to follow the way in which you think God is calling you. And I'll support you in that, in that, um, you know, that discernment, in, in that pathway, trying to figure that out. I don't support what your conclusion is. You follow me? There was a difference there. And I thought that was, yes, exactly. In a Christian community, we're trying to help each other interpret Scripture, understand and, and, and act on that, in ways that we feel very much we're responding to God's grace and what God's calling us to do. And sometimes we'll come to understanding that that's agreement, and sometimes we just don't. And we live with that and we try to keep working together because along the way we might learn some things together. So that's kind of the, another important principle that we kind of have lived with. So that's where we are. Those who are remaining United Methodists are not all progressive. Those remaining IE Methodists are, some of them are very traditional, some of them are very conservative, some are very progressive, some of them are in the middle, right? So there's no, there's no uh, ways in which people are being asked to become, you know, one, one part of the theological spectrum or the other by remaining United Methodists. We're being asked to continue to discern God's will, to interpret scripture together, and to do so around the table of the Lord, around our baptism, around our common 
our common unity as Christ followers, and to agree and live out where we can, and to agree or disagree sometimes, but to keep helping each other, come to the scriptures, keep helping each other, be open to the spirit, keep helping each other, use our hearts and minds to figure out what God is calling us to do in this So that's kind of where we are, that's kind of, kind of some of the background, some of the things we bring to this, and as we discuss this today, we do so as those whom Christ has called, those who love the Lord, who seek uh, to understand what's going on, and who may have differences, I don't know, uh, and uh, we do so with, with an openness to how God's leading us that way. Okay, uh, one thing that I would like to understand as being a change, are United Methodists saying that we are going to ordain um, LGBTQ people to become pastors? So the ordination process is left up to each annual conference. So the or so who gets ordained is left up to every annual conference. We're part of the California Valley Conference. We have seven conferences, whatever it is, in the Western jurisdiction and the other other jurisdiction. So if the prohibition is removed, it hasn't been yet, but if the prohibition is removed, then it's up to the annual conference to decide who they ordain. Some conferences, that may be a, 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 a prohibition for that conference. Mm -hmm. And they figure that we're not ordaining LGBTQ folks. Mm -hmm. or, or they may not ordain people who drink. Mm -hmm. Or people who do whatever, whatever, the, whatever the behavior might be. They, you know, each conference decides what they think is, is relevant in terms of what it means to be living to the highest ideals of the Christian life. So we're looking for mature Christians. We're looking for people who are uh, faithful, who are on the road to perfection and the perfection of love. So all those kind of evidences of the fruit of God's call, of people who are called by God. And so uh, if that's removed, it hasn't been removed yet, if it's removed, then it's up to each annual conference to decide if that's a criteria or not uh, for them. Any so, statements? Yeah. What kind of, yeah, what, 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 are, there, are there questions or are there yeah. dis discussion points? Yeah. Linda. Okay. So, um, we don't know if it's going to happen or not. Is that what you're saying? That that homosexuals or LGBTQ people are going to be ordained? We should not know that. So, we don't, well, well two things. We, we, we don't know if if in the Book of Discipline in 2024, that prohibition is going to be removed. We don't know that yet. We do know that there are annual conferences that are, that are at this point, ordaining LGBTQ folks in, um, in protest against, against, against the Book of Discipline and that prohibition that's been this last 50 years. Has the uh, Northern California, Nevada conference ordained openly gay people? All of the Western conference conferences have all, I think all, almost all. So and, all and, 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 and so what happens is, if, if something happens in which something against the Book of Discipline happens, then charges can be brought uh, against that action, and then there's a process to resolve that. Since, uh, since 2016, the decision was made nationally to kind of suspend all those charges being brought until it was worked out in 2020. That didn't happen, so kind of those charges have been still suspended until 2024 and which something was going to, you know, would work out in the general conference. So, so United Methodist conferences can choose to go against the Book of Dis Discipline? Well, they, the United Methodist people, if you go against the Book of Discipline, there's a process to, there's a disciplinary process that can be brought against you. So if I, as a pastor, go against something in the discipline, and it's a chargeable offense, it's called, there's a process that we go through to, to deal with my offense, right? What's happened the last several years, and it's extended more than we thought because of the pandemic, is that there was the, the charges against that, um, going against it on, on that front, have been kind of suspended for a while until it got worked out. But it's gone longer than we thought because of, you know, we didn't have the 2020 general conference. And so, why did people disaffiliate? Why did churches disaffiliate? So, some, right, so, so the, the 
2025 is, is specifically supposed to be a focus on disaffiliation for purposes related to disagreement about human sexuality. And 2025. The paragraph 2525. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I'm just sorry. <laughs> I know. I'm okay. I'm sorry. I'm so it's the special paragraph that was there right. was there for those churches who wanted to disaffiliate because they had disagreements over the church's position on human sexuality and ordination. But the ironic thing was, actually 2553 was put there uh, to, a lot, to, to provide a pathway for churches that actually were more progressive and didn't think the church was moving fast enough because they thought that in 2020 there would be a resolution for those who wanted to disaffiliate because they, because they didn't, you know, they were more, they, were, they didn't agree with, you know, where the church was going. But because 2020 didn't happen, that paragraph was being used, and so most of the churches, almost all that disaffiliated on 2553 are those who disaffiliated because they do not, are not in agreement with uh, the ordination or the marriage of gay or lesbian people. So it's kind of ironic, that twisted, but that's, but that's kind of mostly why they're doing so. That's, and, and, and that's the reason it's supposed to be over issues of disagreement around human sexuality uh, in 2553. That, that's why the disability. Yeah. I need to ask you, but can you repeat that again? Because it went by too I know, I was kind of confused. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I got confused. Yeah, I'm sorry. So it, there was an agreement, an informal agreement, prior to General Conference 2020 that we thought was going to be brought to general conference that would allow churches to, to leave if they didn't agree with the, the United Methodist Church moving forward with allowing uh, gay, and lesbian and gay, and transsexual be ordained, right? And there was an agreement worked out that, that there was going to be a separation that was going to happen over that issue. In 2019, there was a paragraph added to allow um, people who were probably more progressive on that issue, in other words, were feeling like the church was too slow in changing, allowing for ordination and marriage of gay and lesbian folks, right? And since 2020 never happened, that paragraph is one being used by everybody. And it's being used also by those who are more, you know, would say, you know, were more uh, against that to disaffiliate. So the reason why people are disaffiliating now, almost all the churches disaffiliating now, are disaffiliating because they do not believe in uh, homosexual marriage, they do not believe in gay and lesbian folks being ordained and serving, their, and serving the church. That's why they're leaving. Those who are staying are not taking a position on that, right? Those who are staying, you have churches that are, are for, churches that are against, people who are for, people who are against. So you have the full range of people that remain United Methodists who are, who are, not, who are not saying one way or the other, right? And in their congregation, then you have people all over the spectrum around what they think about that, and yet they still feel they are a congregation, they're a family, and they stick together. <coughs> so those who are leaving are leaving because they're, they don't believe that we should be doing that. Those who are staying, some believe it, some don't believe it, some are in the middle. Does that make sense? Yes. <laughs> yes. So, uh, Stan has his hand up, then Terry. Okay. Oh, Mitch. Mm -hmm. uh, for those of us who may be on the fence to disassociate, what do you see as a benefit so the benefit continues to, to simply be our, our, our connection with one another. That that what I found in taking a, a, a vote with many of our congregations, it becomes it, it, it can become quite divisive. Whereas you you figured out a way to be a church together now. If sometimes you bring this to a vote, you find out that it, it kind of, for some of our churches it kind of it, it kind of divides the church right uh, instead of just the whole church being together. Uh, and so, yeah, and so for all the reasons of, of, of our themes in terms of our, our, the ways in which we look to be, continue to be biblically kind of uh, interpreted the, the Bible, to be, op to be open with our hearts and our minds, to be uh, committed to the, the sense of our tradition of personal holiness and social holiness. And we're, we're very much evangelical in some ways, and we're very much justice-oriented in other ways, and we bring that together in the West and influence. And we do so together. Right? And we're connected and try to support each other with that. There's also just some very, uh, and so I have a, the three <coughs> churches that are, that are dis dis disaffiliating in my district, you know, there also are a lot of just, you know, um, practical things <laughs> that have to do with just legal matters that also are helpful 
when you're part of a larger organization that takes care of a lot of things while you're under their okay. under their nonprofit banner. And so there's just uh, you know a lot there's some benefits just organizationally administratively as well as historically as well as connection as well as the themes that we've emphasized in terms of our uh, the diversity of our congregations and the ways in which we find ways to be together though we're quite diverse from one another. Jerry, I want to um, do the right thing, make the right decision, and I've heard a lot of why it's not okay. Why is it okay? Why, I mean, why, why are we saying, I guess, the church that everybody's staying together, why are they saying that it's okay to ordain a homosexual person or let homosexual <coughs> people get married? Right. So one of the, one of the, and I think, um, so I, I would commend this video to you again. I think you sent around Adam Hamilton's video, but I think it was the one that I think you sent was an introduction to his um, this is life story. Well, the second one was the one you, you should look at that helps to kind of talk about this biblically. That's right? the one I showed you. Church you showed okay. I actually showed you. So the one. Okay, I'll watch it. Yeah, so, no, that's good. But that, that's so that's a good one. Because so one of the things I think when Jesus commands us to love one another, so I think in loving one another, I think what we try to do, I think, in the church is, is at least understand one another, right? And so if I disagree with you, it, 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 I think I at least owe it to you as, as someone who's commanded to love you to understand where you're coming from and to be able to articulate uh, your point of view as well as you can as well as you can articulate. So if I was to share your point of view, and you could say, yeah, Blake, that's it, <laughs> right? And so I think that, that's an important kind of principle in the church is that even though we may disagree, it's important to be able to understand uh, another side as well as, and, and they can recognize it. And so that's what's happening here. So it has to do with the interpretation of scripture, right? So the, re the reason why those who are uh, against the ordination of, uh, of gay and lesbian people uh, and, and, and that kind of thing, uh, they, they, they take that position, uh, they tell me they take on scriptural grounds. All right, here's this passage, here's this passage, here's this passage. Uh, now, I would say then, on the other side of that, those who uh, are affirming of it are also taking it on scriptural grounds. And they're looking at those passages and interpreting those passages in, in a different way and interpreting some other passages uh, in, a, in, a, in another way. So part of it is, is that as we sit around and discuss these things, you may not end up coming at the same conclusion but we're trying to understand what Scripture is saying. So that's one thing. It's on a scriptural basis. There, there, are, there are actually relatively few passages of Scripture that directly address the issue of homosexuality. And there are almost no Scripture passages that address the issue of, of same-sex kind of committed relationship. Right? You have homosexual rape. You have one passage. You have another passage in the Holiness Code. We don't call any other Holiness Code part about what we eat and how we do this and that, separate clothing. So when you kind of have those passages in there, and we're not following these, why are we following this one? Okay, so, so in other words, those kind of interpretation kind of things. And then when you're looking at other passages and what's major, what's minor, and how do we understand scripture through the life, through Jesus, right? So one of the things Adam Hamilton does in that video, he talks about like a lot of the things about the violence in the Old Testament. You know, and Jesus tells us to love our enemies. And then in the Old Testament, you see uh, God command the Israelites to basically, you know, commit genocide. How do you square those two things? Well, we can't disassociate these two things. Jesus, we think, is the word of God made flesh. So we can't take any scripture and bypass Jesus. And we have to put it through his life, death, and resurrection. And so, so, so Christians have come out to different understandings around the scriptural basis, around the prohibition of homosexual folks from being ordained, uh, on scriptural basis. That's one. The second one is, uh, it's, it's kind of like when John Wesley was opposed to lay preachers. And his mother said, he was going to make it a, a rule, you can't have lay preachers in, in Methodist societies. His mother said, I can't remember the guy's name, his mother said, before you make that rule, go listen to so-and-so preach. <laughs> Wesley went and listened to so-and-so preach and, and felt like, you know, how can I, uh, he clearly is called by God to preach. He clearly has the fruit of God to preach and to teach. Uh, maybe, I'm, I, maybe I'm mistaken, right? Same thing happened in the book of Acts when, um, uh, when, when Peter 
was uh, having to deal with the with the Holy Spirit coming upon Cornelius and his ho household. Peter didn't think the Gentiles should be included in the Christian in the Christian family, right? God sent him to Cornelius. And what happened? What happened? He saw the Holy Spirit descend upon this family, and he said, "How can I deny baptism to those who've already received the Spirit?" And so Peter changed his mind. He interpreted Scripture one way, or the Old Testament one way. And then when he saw the evidence of the Spirit in, in, in the life of Cornelius and his family, he thought, well, maybe, you know, I, I, he changed his mind. And they brought that, that change to Acts 15, to the whole church. They had disagreement about it, fight about it. But then they worked it out for that council in Acts 15, that the Gentiles were indeed to be included. But they didn't think they should, scripturally, but they came to the decision that they could because they started to read Scripture differently, interpret it differently, and also the evidence of the Holy Spirit. That's the second reason. There are people now today who are more open about their sexual orientation than used to be. And they're, they, they put themselves out there. And, and so sometimes we know people who are open about their sexuality. And that's the second reason is because, you know, many have seen clearly the call of God upon certain people's lives. Now you've seen the call of God in their life, they've seen the fruit of that, and seen their dedication to, to loving God and loving neighbor, and seeing them in. Uh, either no relationship, being single, or being in a committed relationship, you know, and, 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 uh, and with commitment. You know what I'm saying? And, and, and so they see evidence of, of the call of God in there. So there's, there's scriptural interpretation reasons that, that vary, and then there are, are, are evidence in terms of what's, what's God doing in somebody's life now. So again, we don't agree about all that, but that's kind of to describe why there's disagreement. <laughs> yes, sir. And then we'll go to show off. Okay. I, I have been a Christian since I was 19 years old. I'm 86 now. And I cannot go against what it says in the Bible when it talks about homosexual. And I, I have heard testimony where God has healed them of, of that. I, I just cannot go with that at all. Um, and I'm, I'm not one to stir up trouble. I, I hate conflict. This is really difficult for me to even do. But God woke me up at 3 o'clock this morning and, and, and told me stuff to write. Uh, in my devotional uh, this morning, it was about courage. On the way to town, um, I had the radio on, and this man was talking about he had been over in Africa. And these people had, the Muslims had come in and, and, and run them out. These people were brave enough to come back. And they were singing. It, it, it was uh, Women's Day. And, and they were under these trees singing, you know, and um, to stand up for Jesus. And so I, I have to stand up that way. You know, it, in the New Testament, God tells them, go and sin no more. He says that many, many times. So I, I just cannot be a part of, of that. Uh, they're welcome to come here, and, and I feel, feel that our influence could help them become straight again. I don't know. God's in charge. So and that's, so we, that's the way I feel. Right. And so we have, uh, in all of our churches, most of our churches, people of varying understandings about and they get together for Bible study, and they talk about that. Here's where I understand God, the way I understand Scripture. Here's where I understand what God's saying to me. Here's the way I understand Scripture. Here's the way I understand to me. And they remain a part of the same church, and even though they don't, they feel they feel differently. So that's that's uh, a common occurrence. This does not need to be worked out one way or the other, <laughs> right? It, it doesn't have to be can be, if that's what you want, but there are, there are places in which we come to the table together, bringing our best understanding of scripture, bringing our best understanding of how God is leading us, and then speaking that to one another, and having a chance to kind of dialogue about that, and, and trusting that somehow God continues to, to hold us together in that, because we're a part of Christ. That's how many of our churches uh, continue to, to uh, be a church together, some, now those who disaffiliated, have felt like that this is, that, that, that they, they can no longer be in a church with someone who doesn't feel that this absolutely has to be prohibited. And you have to decide now, they've disaffiliated. 
Those who feel like, okay, you know, I disagree strongly or I think you're wrong, but we, there's some value in our, our continued witness to the community, our service to the community, our worshiping together, and our doing Bible study together, have continued to stay together and continue to work through that, even though they may disagree, you know, absolutely with each other. They feel like, oh, we're still a family, and we're going to be church together, even though you're wrong. Kind of thing, you know? mm -hmm. So that's the difference, right? Those who think they can do that, those who think that they can't do that. Cheryl, and then back to Sheila. Um, I know this is going to sound maybe simplistic, but um, what led me to this specific church was open heart, open mind, open door. And I feel that the person that's going to judge me at the end of my days will be him. It doesn't really matter to me about what other people think or how they want to judge me because I truly believe I will be judged up there and that goes for everybody. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Sheila. Sheila. Sorry, I just wanted to read a section here because you mentioned Romans and, and talking about how... Could you speak a little louder, please? That's as loud as I can. <laughs> oh, I can hear you good. Okay. okay, so, um, and how there are those that agree with their interpretation and there are those that don't. So, can you help me understand this? So, the Apostle Paul warned that God's wrath is coming on this world for its rejection of God and because evil people suppress eternal truth. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness, because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown to it to them, in Romans 1, 18-19. Paul explained that men and women who reject God would lose themselves into immoral behavior. He gave a list of sins, which we're all familiar with, and warned that it is not only wrong to do those things, but also to approve of those who practice them. That's Romans 1, 32. We must not hate people, and there is never a time for a true Christian to commit violence. Thus, but we must hate sinful practices and not celebrate or excuse them. In the sad world, we must muster courage to speak truth in love. So can you just explain to me, that it, it just sounds contradictory, and I just want clarification. Sure, so I would say just, first of all, in general, this is the kind of thing that the local church and the local church, having these kind of questions and talking together about this, that's where it needs to happen. Right? If you guys say, here's a passage, what's being said here, having some help with some people to kind of dig into to what's, being, what's being said here and how we deal with that. that. That's what the church is for. And for us to bring our, our questions in our minds and not, to feel, and not to feel hesitant about doing that. Because in, frankly, in some places, you know, if, if you bring certain questions, you, you, you can be shunned and ostracized. In our church, we want you to bring your questions, we want you to bring your mind, and then to help each other figure out what those passages are. Uh, the Romans, the Romans passage, in fact, and then also if you go and read Romans two, uh, it talks about what you're talking about. Judge not, lest you be judged. So after going through this list of kind of saying, you know, we need to be careful about our sins and how how we need to, to be away from those, we have to help people to do that. And then it goes on to talk about not judging. So there's those two things also also to go in there. Some of the passages that have to do with that, that do explicitly name homosexuality as a sin. Some of those uh, are also using, using a word that has to do with like promiscuous behavior, right? Sometimes the word is not really dealing with and are referring to, again, the situation where you have people who are committed to each other in a, in a, in a monogamous relationship, for instance. It's just not being addressed. So sometimes that's what's going on sometimes. And sometimes there's, there's uh, the, the, the condition like it was with slavery, for instance, in the biblical passages that they assume slavery, right? And so, for, 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 for unfortunately, you know, there's a long Christian history uh, of supporting slavery biblically, and 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 we look upon that now as, as an evil, as as a, as a complete dis distortion. But there are passages there that you could quote that would explicitly uh, seem to allow uh, slavery to exist and even to beat your slave as long as they don't die within two days. It happens to me that you know within a couple of days, and we look at that now and say, no, no, no. We were not, those Christians were not interpreting that, that, that passage appropriately in, in light of the whole scripture, in light of Jesus, 
But they're taking these, and there are many more passages on that than there are on homosexuality, by the way. There's hundreds kind of you could use to support slavery because it was, it was always there. It was assumed. And so part of Paul's letter is almost kind of like, even though his principle is, you know, we, we all are set free, male or female, slave or free, we're all one in Christ. There's the principle of, of complete equality. Yet in practice, there was slavery happening, and, and then so, you know, they thought, well, if they were, they were good slave owners, right? They were better slave owners. They, they, they followed certain rules. That would be better. So that's true with these passages as well. We need to dig into them and, and, and interpret them in light of Jesus and in light of, of, of uh, is this something that's, that's time-bound or that's applying to a specific situation that Paul's dealing with? In one passage, he, in one part, in another uh, book, Paul tells, uh, says women shouldn't speak in church. Now, is that because women shouldn't speak in church? Because he had a problem with that church. There were some things being stirred up by some women in that church, and so he prohibited that. Whereas in another place, you have Priscilla and Aquila. Priscilla seems to be the leader in that, in that couple and, and, and her apostolic work and what she's doing. And you see Paul having many women companions in his work. Yet and over here, he's talking about women being silent and making sure their heads covered and, and being submissive to men. But I'm saying, so there's, there's situations sometimes that, 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 just, that we can understand that Paul's dealing with or someone's dealing with that apply to that circumstance. In some things, it applies to us generally for all time. And sometimes we need to really uh, say, well, what, how do we understand that through, through the person who did it? But this is the very same thing that we think needs to happen in all of our local churches, where people come with honest questions with one another. What's the scripture really say? How do we understand it in light of the whole scripture? And how do we help each other to, to understand what's being said here? And, and, and how do we come to either agreement or at least disagreement, but that's, we're still helping each other get to, get to what, that, what that is. So that needs to happen you know, in our, each of our local churches. On a, on a, on a, and, and the more diverse your group is, by the way, the better off. Because if all we're doing is just reinforcing our, our group thing, or, you know, we, that's what happens right now on the internet. We get into those loops of, what do you call it, um, you know, you're in the, you're in the, you know, uh, you're, in the, you're in the same bubble. You don't ever get another opinion. So the more diverse your church is studying scripture, actually, the more helpful it is, because we see things that others don't see, and we help each other to kind of come at some of these things in that. I, I will say one, it, just a split second. The reason we're having this meeting is because I, as pastor, and I think I've been here three and a half years on this, maybe four, this time, did not bring the issues or clarify the issues for our congregation. And so when three weeks ago, I began speaking about where we were and how many churches were disaffiliated. That was when the issue came to our congregation of what do you mean? We missed our chance if that's what we want to do as a church. And from the standpoint of section 25? 2553. 2553, we have missed our chance to go through that process if we as a church choose to um, disaffiliate. Um, when Stan was asking, what are the benefits of being United Methodist, I could go on a lot more than Blake can about being United Methodist and why I think it's a good thing. But I think it really is important that we share our feelings. I have not talked about the right to life or choice in, in our church. I haven't talked about those things. Maybe we as a church need to hear different opinions, you know, of, about very um, significant issues. I haven't talked at a church about uh, police brutality as a church. And I was asked to go join a George Floyd march, which I did as an individual, as opposed to as a person of pastor of this church. But justice is justice for all. We all need to be treated fairly and be listened to and understood in terms of our positions. And I apologize to our congregation for not keeping you up to speed or my not being aware of the feelings that some of you have expressed. Thank you. Let me say one thing about that too. So I hope that if you know if you if you kind of do get more direct and talking about some of these things together. 
just uh, it's an opportunity to, to together learn how to do this as Christians mm -hmm. and not do it as the world does. Mm -hmm. and, and right now we're being pulled dramatically into, into, into polarizing points of view on all kinds of issues and then encouraged to fight over it and, and vote over it and separate over it, society-wise. So how do we do it differently as Christians? How do we come at things? And, and what do we, you know, Wesley said, in, in essentials unity, you know, in non-essentials diversity, in all things charity or love, he's quoting somebody else. So how do we practice that? And what is essential? Jesus Christ, his life, death, resurrection. Jesus is essential, right? You probably can't be a church Together, we can, we, we can work together, we can serve together, but we probably can't be a Christian church if we don't believe in Jesus. Right. Right? That's essential. Right. We may love each other, we may work together, we may engage in justice acts together, we'll do so as partners, but we won't do so as the church because the church is the church of Jesus. Mm -hmm. You follow me? So there are some essential things. Jesus Christ is essential. There are some things that are, that are non-essential but really important to us. Mm -hmm. Okay? And, and, and we're going to agree to disagree, or we'll agree to fight, but we're going to stick together because, you know, they're, they're not, they're not, they're not, they don't undermine Jesus, you know what I'm saying? And there are some things that, um, that, you know, but in all things we're going to love each other, even if we separate. So these, these three churches that separated, I think, you know, uh, I actually had, you know, some very good meetings with them. And I think we did, we both did our, our jobs, I think, at, at, at respecting and at, at disaffiliating in a way, I hope, that was still with, with a sense of, you know, we're still part of the same body for Christ, whether we like it or not, in, in general, we're not going to be on Methodist together anymore. You follow what I'm saying? Okay. Second thing is, yes, so in order to disaffiliate this year uh, favorably, uh, you had to have, uh, the final conference would have had to have voted to affirm your vote. So we've missed that time frame if you want to disaffiliate. You can always disaffiliate. But the terms aren't, aren't as, as, uh, as favorable. As I say, in 2024, there may be another round of more favorable terms, or there may not. I don't know. Can you tell us what the favorable and unfavorable are? So the favorable, yeah, the so favorable terms in terms of what, of, of what it, it takes to disaffiliate and what kind of financial kind of uh, Agreements are made in disaffiliation, so there's like there's unfunded pension liability that needs to be covered. There's 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 a, there's a check to see if there's any back insurance. There's a there's an issue to be settled about the property itself and how that gets understood. What happens to the property? Who has the property? Uh, there's issues around uh, there's legal issues. So is that the favorable? Like what are the favorable? Oh well, He's right, right, right. Well, the un—it's well, not unfavorable. Just that the unfavorable <laughs> is is that to do it, and you can always disaffiliate. Un, un, there's a way to do it in the book of discipline has always been, but that just means you know that basically you know Wesley made it very difficult for churches to leave, and very costly for churches to leave, uh, so we wouldn't leave, <laughs> basically, and some of those more costly uh, ways have been reduced. Under the 2553 this year, they, they go away at the end of the year, and they may some of those more favorable conditions may be opened up in 2024, or they may not. So that, that's why. There, so there's just more restrictions in the Book of Discipline to leave by design. The less they want churches going, you know, separated, and and for this little window, there's been the General Conference has allowed some some more some some less financial. Uh, uh, responsibility. And, and there is actually a video, and I wouldn't like to try and delete, delineate everything, but I can send and post the video. One of them is only paying 20% of the value of the property. The video that I saw from um, this board that met with the different churches, how much of the um, pastor's uh, retirement. Is this the favorable one or the unfavorable? Favorable. That is so it's we're it's too late for favorable now, according to what we're hearing. Is that correct? You may, you may, you, you may get a more favorable maybe in 2024. That's a big maybe. Yeah. But you know you're not getting it now. Yeah. Well, and I have a question. So I'm saying, well, saying well, let me just say this. Okay. The other question is, who in this congregation, and we need, and I think it's worth, taking the time within the congregation to find out where we are as a congregation. 
Absolutely. Because, Absolutely. because Absolutely. you know, until, until we know, right now I think there are 37 members of our congregation, and those are the only people who are eligible to, to vote on it. We need to look at those numbers, Absolutely. look at who they are, because we can talk to the cows come home, as you mentioned, you had one church that had- So I had one church, it's a very small church, and they were really stirring things up. And, and, and so I went to them, I met them a couple times, and, and they decided to kind of take an informal straw vote, because you need two thirds. Sure. And if, if you don't, if you're not, I, I say to people, if, if you know you're not, you're not 99%, it, it, it's just gonna divide your congregation, don't do it. <laughs> So they did an informal survey and they found out that there were 21 people who voted. Three people wanted to disaffiliate, 18 did not. And so why go through the process of dividing the church if that's what the ratio is? Now in one, the one in, the one that disaffiliated, their vote was 100% mm -hmm. disaffiliated. Mm -hmm. Like two of the three were 100%. Mm -hmm. So of course, then it you know, didn't divide, then they're gonna all go together. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's what came for me when she first said in the first Sunday is that the Congregation needs to decide as a body mm -hmm. if people want to for the majority or they don't. Mm -hmm. At least we know. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm saying too. That's mm -hmm. what I've always been saying. Mm -hmm. Everybody has to walk their path. I agree with Cheryl. Everybody is going to be judged by God. Mm -hmm. My Part of what my angst is, is the Bible says the leaders are held to a higher standard. We are to follow Jesus. And Jesus does not condemn anybody, ever. But Jesus has never not obeyed God. And you can't find anything to do the other. I've looked, I've been trying to see that peace. And I haven't seen it in scripture for me. But the other side of it is, it, it's about for me, as church council chair, that the whole congregation be able to at least do a straw vote mm -hmm. and say, do you want it or do you not want it? That way it'll be the end of it for me because I feel an obligation to the congregation as church council chair. Mm -hmm. That's where I came from around this whole thing is not, it was never, and I, I know, Boris, I, and I'm not throwing you under the bus. I mean, COVID happened and you had all kinds of physical things going on health-wise. That's not what I'm saying, but it's, for me, it's an fairness in allowing in allowing the straw vote, at least. Yeah, that's thank, all. Thank you. And just and again, so and, and when you do that, just make sure that, that people right. So this is part of this is making sure that hope that when you take a straw vote, that say that people feel they have accurate information, they know what's going on, that kind of thing. Because sometimes, like like for instance, there are there are there are some things going around that's saying that that if you remain, you can't be tradition. That's not true. You probably saying that right. So so. Those who remain on that, this, they do not, you're not, you're not need to decide whether you agree or disagree on this issue necessarily, right? You may, you may not, you follow what I'm saying? So, so those who don't, don't go through the process, they're just remaining as they are, as diverse as they are, and that's fine with them. So you're not, people are not necessarily having to make a decision about what they think on this issue necessarily. Some people, you follow what I'm doing? It's not, you're not, you're not, you're not even to choose. This way is progressive and this way is traditional. This way is mixed, and this way is more traditional. We just need to be aware what the issue Correct. is. And that has never gone out to everybody, ever. And that's what I want to make sure that everybody knows. And then whatever people decide, you have to follow their own spiritual path. Yeah, and this was wonderful having, um, when I first set out, was going to send out a blurb, I sent it to, to Reverend Blake to ask him, is this what I can say? He said, no, 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 let me offer you something else. And that's what went out. So that we understand what the issue is and that all of the stuff we've been hearing may not be the direct issue, but understand that nobody's going to require anybody to, to do anything or to, oh. to, yeah, okay. So for me, you give one example. So some churches thought that, that if, if uh, that, that churches in the future are going to be required to, uh, to have gay weddings in their church. You know, that, that's just not true, right? The pastor is, and the, the pastor is always the one who, who, who or I'll put it this way, that, 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 that their pastor is going to be required to perform gay weddings. Mm. Right? That's, that was circulating quite a bit. No United States pastor has ever been forced to perform any wedding. 
<laughs> That's complete at the discretion of, the, of the, each pastor, is who they will agree or who they will not agree to marry. That's true for every couple. Mm -hmm. If they think this, this couple's not, uh, not ready or is immature, or they, they're, they're free not to do the wedding. They don't have to do it anyway. So, so there was a, some people thought there was the idea that pastors who were against, for instance, same-sex marriage, were going to be forced to do so. Well, that's, that's ridiculous. That's never been true in Methodism forever. And no pastor is forced to do anything that they don't. So that's the kind of about the accurate information and make sure it's happening. She's building your question. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, so we'll go Sheila. Tom had a Oh, Tom. No, she moves before Tom. Sheila, Sheila Tom, <laughs> Pat, Zoe. <laughs> Good. So and, I kind of lost my rhythm, my, my point, but the clarity that I asked for, thank you. And then I just wanted to touch on that as well, if you could help me understand where Jesus, where he was with the crowd and, and his disciples, and they said um, about changes, and he responded back, I am not here to change the law of the prophets. I, have, I am not and will not change one dot of my Father's word. So when we go back to Father's word in the Old Testament, I, I understand what you're saying, how we're, we're looking at the times and the changes, you know, about women being preachers and things as such. Help me understand so what that means when he, sa he said to them in the New Testament, I have not changed one iota, one dot of my Father's mm -hmm. word. And that the, the gate to get to heaven, is, the road is very narrow. So I as, well, I, mean, I as a Christian am very concerned. I love this church. I love it. I love Morris. Um, I love what we do here. I, I feel that we're on fire. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm committed to God. I'm committed to Jesus. And we're in a time where things are chaotic and confusing. And there's division amongst a lot. So help me understand when Jesus said, I have not changed any of my Father's words, my Father's commandments, his statutes, his ordinances. So, yes, let me give you a, I'll give you a short answer to that. Thank this you. is a long and a great conversation to have mm -hmm. in a long Bible study over several weeks. I would love to. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus said he came to, uh, he came to fulfill the law. Fulfill the, yes. Right? He fulfilled the law through his life, death, and resurrection and ascension. The law he fulfilled was the law to love God with your whole heart, your whole heart, soul, mind, and strength, to love your neighbor as yourself. When he fulfilled that law, he fulfilled it. That means that we no longer have to, we're no longer required to follow the the um, blood sacrifice. The blood sacrifice. We no longer follow, we no longer follow even the dietary, the dietary laws in the Old Testament, which are clearly laws. We no longer follow a lot of things because, all those intermediate things, because Jesus fulfills those things, right, in that. And what he's fulfilling is this law of love, uh, the nature of God, and to demonstrate that. Jesus was accused himself of not keeping the Sabbath. He was accused of all kinds of things because he does supersede those things in his life, death, and resurrection. He is the Word made flesh. And the Word must adhere to his witness, the written Word. It must adhere to his, his witness or, or be superseded by it, but you can't, you can't take a word without taking it through him. So the short answer is, is that, yes, he fulfills it. It doesn't mean that we're required to do the blood sacrifice anymore, we're required to do the dietary laws anymore, that we're required to do all kinds of things, because he's already, his sacrifice is once and for all. Right? So the interpretation of his sacrifice supersedes all those laws about how you sacrifice a bull for this and that sin, for everything. He takes away the sins of the world. You see there how that, how that biblical interpretation does show you how it is fulfilled in him. This is not needed anymore. He's fulfilled. This, in fact, shadowed what he was to do. It doesn't take more place over what he was to do. So, a lot more to that. It'd be great to have lots of conversation about that. And that's a great, great question. And this is what we should be doing, right, together and exploring these kind of things. Because we want to follow God's way. We love God. We want to do what God wants, not what we want. So just to get back at the disaffiliation and the requirement or the window, mm -hmm. okay, if, if, if we were to do a straw vote, it doesn't really matter anyway because we have a big maybe for next year. But 
from what I understand is the conference, the Southern Conference or the California Conference has opened the window up to go to the end of the year. How come we have a window that stops over in the middle of the year and not to the end of the year of 2023? So you can disaffiliate. So you have to, you have to, right, you have till the end of the year to fulfill your terms and conditions to disaffiliate. That's what's to the end. That's what's to the end of the year. It's the terms and conditions. It's, it's the annual conference vote that also is needed. So since we don't have an annual conference plan beyond now, there's no way to get the annual conference vote to disaffiliate. They, they have a special, I talked to the Southern California Bishop Lady, or not her, but her assistants, and they are, they have chosen to do, their conference has chosen to do a special annual conference to allow churches to disaffiliate before the end of the year. So they're having that later, you're saying? They're having so a special one. Later. I know I know that there was a lot of conferences that had special ones early. So you heard a lot about a lot of disaffiliations that happened in February, March, and April before the normal June annual conference time in which they called a special general conference. But they had so many that they just dealt with all the disaffiliated churches. Right? <clears throat> so that, I, I know about that. I don't know. I can find out about Southern California doing it later. As of now, we don't have a plan as an annual conference to have another special special one because we don't have any other churches that have indicated to us that they wanted to disaffiliate. Bishop, Bishop Dick sent something out in January or March trying to encourage everyone to let us know if you're thinking about it so we can get you in the flow, into the system, into the process to have time to do it. Um, and we don't know of any church, other church now that's, that's, that's thinking about doing it that would warrant a call. And, and even those six churches, some of them wanted a, a special general conference to do it earlier. But there was only six of them, and so we thought that you know it would be appropriate just to do it regularly at our regular meeting. Cool. So right now, I don't know. There, there's no there's no special one being called for our for our conference. There was special ones in other conferences. I don't, I don't know maybe about Southern California. They, well, they, the main thing that concerned me is that we were never even given notice that something was coming down that we needed that we had this window to be in. We were never. And now, obviously, Morris already apologized for that and. And you have been aware that we've been talking about stuff like that, looking to see where this property is and everything like that. We were never given that choice to be able to, A, do a straw vote, B, make a vote if we're going to disaffiliate or not. Find out where everybody's at. We weren't even given that opportunity. Well, I will say that on the, in 2019, when Linda called the special meeting, I think it was January of 2019, we discussed leaving method system or having the uh, property. And at that discussion, it was decided if we can retain our property, because I spoke adamantly about why being a United Methodist was a positive thing. But when I sent the information to Reverend Blake, um, he asked, was it in relation to disaffiliating because of, of uh, the issue of homosexuality. I think that's what you said. And I told him, oh, no, that can't be our church because we've already had, we've already had a gay pastor here. Can I respond to that real quick? Yes. Before you came back, mm -hmm. we had a lesbian couple living in the pastor. And they yes. were our pastors. Our she, was, she was an intern. To the intern, whatever it was. Anyway, mm -hmm. our church membership, the people coming here, mm -hmm. was zero. Um, there was a, maybe not zero. One, two, three. Mm -hmm. I know for a fact that we put money into the coffers in order to keep this place afloat. Mm -hmm. I have volunteered here multiple times mm -hmm. to keep this place yes. functioning and yes. afloat. Yes. My money, my time is worth money. My tithe yes. and everything. So yes. it's like. That those years, that period of time that we had a lesbian couple leading us mm -hmm. was horrendous. Okay. I, I will say this, every time, yes, yes. I would say every time you get a new pastor, you're going to lose membership. Um, when I first started in 2009, we had people who left our church, went to the Baptist church. Um, each pastor, there's going to be a turnover. You'll have new people who will come who never came to church before, who find it, and there will be people who will 
be members of our church and be away for two or three years or 10 years or even 15 years or 20 years. And then they come back to church. So when you're dropping people from the roles, one of the things we say is, you know, are you in touch with these folks? Do they still have a feeling for your church? So there are certain people that we put on our list to drop from the roles, and you have to do it three years in a row before they can be officially dropped from the roles. So yes, we had fewer people here during the time that we had the intern with us. But perhaps it was the, their outreach or whatever. Yes? I, I don't, I just, I mean, I met that woman, and I have to say, I take people by character, um, and uh, not, I'm, I'm a heterosexual woman, probably, I'm not like, you know, uh, mm -hmm. that, um, this, this other, whatever they have, that mm -hmm. thing. but um, I know there's people that are straight and, and, and have very bad character mm -hmm. and have problems and they're not, you know, people mm -hmm. That follow our Bible the way we like, mm -hmm. and then there's people who are maybe are not in that way the same way, and there's some people that are live consensual relations, I guess. In the time of the Bible in the Old um, Testament, I realized I recognized that you know there was a lot of slavery, there mm -hmm. was a lot of um, uh, punishment, and 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 also uh, a fear of um, losing uh, population. And so all these things really <coughs> created a lot of um, problem, you know, in the communication for people. But I feel like, do we really get, did you ever talk to that woman? Because I did. I talked to her, I wanted to, the, yeah, and, you know, what your husband was oh, saying, how oh, he disliked okay. it. I mean, did you ever, I mean, I think it's our responsibility to, to get up and speak up, and not, instead of like, these people ran away to the other church. Did they ever even really, say, you know, I have a problem with this and I, I would like to discuss it, or I would like to get to know this person. I did find this person had a couple problems, I have to say, but they were her personal problems. Um, and, and I see that in all humans. Mm -hmm. And so I, I just want to say that we need to stand up and, and speak up like that word that I read today. Mm -hmm. um, that's what it said, that we need to speak up mm -hmm. like you and your wife are saying, and I, I'm so glad that you know people can communicate like that and say, but we, when, if, when there is something, we need to speak up and not hide it, oh, and then later on run from it. Let me say, Zoe asked uh, to, to be able to Well, say. I'm not sure what I really want to say, except okay. Brian is just new, coming in, just, just learning and reading, starting mm -hmm. to read the Bible, and I mm -hmm. really, uh, Boris was, uh, one of the reasons why I was pulled to this church, I haven't, um, I'm still searching, mm -hmm. um, and I just hope the congregation knows that, uh, and they look at our community, and, and that they they know that they just need to keep the open heart yes. and the open mind. Yes. 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 Thank you. I agree. Uh, <clears throat> we had been gone for a few years, and we came back, and the lesbian pastor was here, and I thought, well, you know, I need to see what it's mm -hmm. all about. So I came. I came twice. Mm -hmm. I I could not get anything biblical out of her mm -hmm. message. Uh, it was about more about her lifestyle, the music. Um, you know, I, I just was totally turned off by her. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that. I, I will say that there, we had pastor parish relations committees while they were here, while, and discussed her a lot. And we agreed that her partner could live with her in the parsonage. I mean, those of you who are here, and I attended a number of their ser services sermons, and I don't recall hearing the same thing you heard that, on the two times you. I never heard her discuss her. her Sexuality or sexuality at all. Well, she didn't. She didn't say all this, but mm -hmm. um, I didn't find anything biblical. I understand. I, now that I understand. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. I had somebody tell me once before. A couple of people actually that said that at that point of time in this church mm -hmm. they were not being fed. Uh -huh. Well, yeah, I you yeah. know, I I had people the first time I was here, and uh, one. I can't remember her name. She 
with her butt standing girl, and she said, you don't talk about the Bible enough, you know. And then, you know, he, uh, it'll come to me. But um, she has since passed. But if anyone else, I think we need to have another meeting. We need to have another community meeting. I appreciate Reverend Blake driving over today. And, and let me just say too, you know, like again, you know, uh, I want to be helpful to you. You know, uh, and in fact, the bishop has asked all of our superintendents, whatever churches are discerning together, mm -hmm. that uh, there's a process, and we need to be, and we we want to be helpful to you in that. Mm -hmm. So we want to support you <laughs> in in the information you need, and we'll support you in being the community you want to become, mm -hmm. and then support decisions you want to make that you feel are faithful to make, and to help you to do that, right? Mm -hmm. it, 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 and yes. so, you know, I apologize that for some reason we got mixed up in terms of how all this information is communicated and whatnot. You know, we do, we're not trying to, you know, be in any way, you know, uh, we want to be helpful yes. to you in your process yes. and what you need to yes. feel God's calling to do. Yes. Oh, and I, I didn't open in prayer. So we, def we can close in prayer. <laughs> oh, yeah, but definitely close in prayer. Oh, uh, Tara. So are, are we going to take a vote today because don't you think we should? No, we're not taking a vote. Yeah, but if there's only two people who want to stay and everybody else wants to go, mm -hmm. shouldn't we know that? So but I don't we know should I notice all of the membership. membership. Yeah. I thought that was today. No, no, no. 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 Oh, okay. No. This was informational. Okay. Yeah, this is an informational meeting. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And it's up to you. I mean, I mean, you know, it's also, I mean, just my practical advice would be, you know, again, I don't know what's happening next year. Um, and if you if you have enough people you feel you want to, but then you need to decide what, what's the timing of it. Mm -hmm. you just go ahead now, <laughs> whatever it is, or do we see if it's going to be a better conditions or not? Mm -hmm. you know, there won't be there won't be worse conditions. Mm -hmm. There may be better conditions. Mm -hmm. So, but but you may if you decide well we don't want to wait. That's fine too. Mm -hmm. We can figure that out. Pat, uh, I'm not against the games, mm -hmm. but I hold pastor to a higher standard, mm -hmm. and I think that it, they should be, um, um, what it says in the Bible, a, a pastor should be. There's a whole you know, bunch of scriptures about that. Mm -hmm. And I think that it would be very difficult for um, a homosexual to, to preach to me. Mm -hmm. or to anybody like that. Mm -hmm. And I, I want them to come. I want them to see how we live. I, mm -hmm. You know, but if they stay totally in their little world, they're not, they're going to lose track of, mm -hmm. or, you know, of what the other half is. And um, I think we could influence them to think maybe a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, mm -hmm. I, I like the open doors, mm -hmm. you know. Yes. Well, um, we should have, I would suggest that our church council uh, chair uh, consider establishing a, um, a schedule where the council will meet and set a schedule of informal meetings or formalized meetings where we can get some specifics so we can talk about this. This is not the end by any means, and this is not the official anything. <coughs> This is informational. Only. So let me make sure that clear too. So mm -hmm. it's also so yeah, informational only. So the for anything to be official, a mm -hmm. official decision, uh, eventually you need a charge conference mm -hmm. right. or a church conference. Yes. And, that, that, and, a, and we probably make this a church conference, which would be open to all members, mm -hmm. and that includes the superintendent there to preside at that. Mm -hmm. So you may do some things to help to the, where you're at, and then if you want to keep moving along that path, make sure you keep me in the loop. So I like, make sure we're scheduling things in a way that, that meets your time frame. And there is, we haven't gotten the year, this year's church council or the charge conference yeah, scheduled no, we yet. Probably, we probably would do a special one if you want to take mm -hmm. a, a vote on something. Okay, like so, so the first thing, and I'm, the people that are here, I just want to know from the ones that are here. I feel like the first thing that should happen is to do the roles and ask how, they, how everyone as a whole feels. And if the majority feels like staying here and, and being United Methodist Church, then
then there's no point in having any discussion. I mean, is, do people feel that way? Well, I think the discussion is good no matter what. I mean, but do you I mean, think, do you you think we should at least do it? still first and then do your vote thing. Mm -hmm. but, I mean, the discussion is healthy for everybody. But at least know which way we're, if we're going to, if we're just going to have discussions about it all, or if we are um, going to make a move one way or another. I, I just feel like people need to know that and see where we are with that. But I think people That's need right. to, I think people need to have a discussion too. Or a presentation. A, a, a or presentation or discussions, because I think that, that if you look at all the members of the church, I don't think everybody knows that nobody knows. No, no, so so in order to be all fair, I, I think we should have a couple of discussions so that everybody can get the proper information, the correct information. I mean, mm -hmm. I know we've all heard some things that got clarified today that we've heard in the world. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I think it's important for us to have those discussions which that will lead to the opportunity to have a healthy vote. That, and informed, that, and, and informed. informed. That's what I meant. Healthy, informed. Yes. What do you think? I don't think we've got more discussions. But, I mean, we had the whole litany of, okay, so you're talking about uh, male and female being in committed relationships together, right? Or, or but guys maybe are, next year it may be the whole gamut. Correct? Well, exactly. That's what I'm. Was, mm -hmm. Is it correct that next conference it could be? The, L, the whole thing. Oh, well, is that a possibility? I, I, well, I, don't, I think the only thing being, it's just removing a prohibition. So then, then you don't, I mean, the NL so conference. So it's open if you remove the prohibition. Well, it's, it's, it's open, it's technically open, well, yes, but, but I mean, so the, the, the conference, the, the discipline puts it in the hands of the conference. And the conference certainly, when you go through all these things, you're checking for people's you know, their commitment to Christ, sure. their, their no, theological no. orthodoxy, right. Right. So, and, 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 there's, and it's not always prescribed. It used to be you couldn't, uh, you couldn't smoke or drink. Well, you probably still shouldn't do those things, <laughs> but it's not specifically prohibited. Yeah. That got removed, but yet still some of that may be informed. You know, you want people over to be drinking, people to be smoking, you know what I'm saying? So some of those behavioral kind of things are removed. doesn't mean they're still not important when you're, when you're interviewing somebody going through what their lifestyle choices are what their practices are, but it's not specifically prohibited. So that's true. It's not specifically prohibited, so then it would be left up to the discretion of the of the of the district community ordained ministry, the board of ordained ministry, and then the, the clergy session of the annual conference when they vote on these people coming through. They'd be voted on on those on those bases. Uh, so, so it'd be like an individual on an individual basis. Correct. Regardless of their lifestyle. Basically. Correct, although their lifestyle may red flag, red, red, raise flags for, for, for the committee. Say, no, you know, that's just not, yeah. not and, Christian practice. And check their social network. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> the last 10 years, see what they put online. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, are we ready to close today? Because it's been close to an hour and. I'll stick around a little bit. You want to come up and ask some things first and then have I just want to say one more thing. Mm -hmm. In checking their social that media, uh -huh. they could have been saved in that process. They could have came mm -hmm. to life. Oh, that's true. That's true. So if we're going to, you know, we're not judging. Right? Yes. I, I apologize. Okay. That, that <laughs> was a I just, I, I know. I just, <laughs> I, I just, it's, I just want clarification. That's all. I, I have one more thing. Thank you very much for coming. Yes, yes. Well, thank, thank you. I appreciate your time. I appreciate being thank here. You. I appreciate thank all you. of you and your uh, searching with all of this and your being the kind of community that you are together. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Thank you very much. Yeah. Jared, will you send me the video that he was talking about that I should watch? Yes. I want to see it too. Please. Yes. Well, they're, they're all on YouTube. Oh, There's okay. a whole series of them. There's six of them. The number two oh. is the main one to look at for that. Yeah, I'll, I thought I put the link on okay. after we did the church service, but I will okay. post two it. video links. The, the two that I sent out were the first two of this series, and I said that there are a total of, I may have said that, I should have said there were a total of six, where the global representative says this, and then it is uh, the UMC, you know, staying in the United Methodist. Okay. Yeah. Boris, if not everybody does Facebook, could you, like, send an email to? I will send those emails. The link, please. Thank you. I'll send the links on email. <laughs> Thank also. you. Thank you.
And then you're not saying, on Facebook too for those that follow that. Yes. Not everybody we, does because a, a lot of people who are interested in our church are on our Facebook yeah. page and watch, though they're not members. Yeah. Right. right. So yes, I'll I'll double dip all over the hands. I'll triple dip. Thank you. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. sorry. Yes. Um, when I came here, I had been praying to know what I, how I should feel, because I, I was feeling kind of bad, thinking maybe I was wrong. You have helped me a lot, and I really appreciate it a lot. Appreciate it. Now I know how I need to go. So I appreciate it. Okay. Let's close in prayer. All powerful God, who supports your children as they grow and learn about you and how we are to respond to this world you have created. Continue to enlighten us, awaken us, strengthen us, and support us as we continue to love you. This we pray in the name of your Son, Christ Jesus. Amen. 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 Thank you, Lord. Safe journey. Thank you. Thank and you. thank 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 you. Thank